Hi, I'm Josh Stanley from National Geographic's American Weed in the Realm of Caring Foundation. It is truly my honor and privilege to be able to narrate A Question of Compassion by Peter McWilliams. www.petermcwilliams.org. Please visit the site. One of my heroes here. It's, it's truly a great honor to be able to take part in this project and be able to get this important piece of work out to the public. It's a question of compassion. An AIDS cancer patient explores medical marijuana, copyright 1998 by the Medical Botanical Foundation, distributed by Prelude Press. We are compassionate people. We cheer when we hear that someone, even someone we don't know, has survived a serious illness or accident. We make exceptions for the sick every day. We pull over to let ambulances by we reserve for the disabled some of the best parking places in town. We trust our physicians to write prescriptions for amphetamines, speed, barbiturates, downers, morphine, the active ingredient in heroin, cocaine, and a physician's desk reference full of drugs with side effects ranging from dry mouth to death. Aspirin, for example, is a drug considered so safe it doesn't even require a prescription. Millions of children are given aspirin by loving parents every day. All this in spite of the fact that aspirin-induced bleeding kills more than 1,000 Americans every year. And yet, an herb that has few side effects and no known lethal dose. Not one fatality in 5,000 years of recorded human use is one of the most illegal substances on earth. Doctors cannot prescribe, and since the passage of the Omnibus Crime Bill in 1995, if the United States government, our United States government, catches you with enough of it, even for medicinal purposes, it can put you to death. Please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Peter McWilliams. I'm an author who self-publishes out of defense. I have been writing and printing and selling my own books for 30 years. More people know the titles of my books than know me by name. How to Survive the Loss of a Love Life 101 Do it! Let's get off our butts! How to Heal Depression Hypericum St. John's Wort and Depression. Ain't nobody's business if you do. I even wrote a book about surviving life-threatening illnesses eight years ago. You can't afford the luxury of a negative thought. A book for people with an any life-threatening illness including life. I was glad to have that book on hand. In mid-March 1996, I was diagnosed as having AIDS and cancer. Beware the Ides of March indeed. I went in for a growth on my neck. It resembled the animated pimple from hell in those Clearasil commercials designed to drive teenagers into fits of embarrassed discretionary spending. It turned out to be a tumor. I was lucky it was where it was. It seems my body was riddled with tumors. Like most people who die from cancer, I had been ignoring the danger signs for months. 
I was lucky enough to get a tumor on my neck. If it weren't for the cosmetic embarrassment, I'd be dead now. My cancer was diagnosed as non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It is readily treatable if it is caught before it reaches the brain. If it reaches the brain, they send you home to um, prepare. It was a tense two weeks getting tested and waiting for results. Fortunately, although there are decidedly mixed opinions on the subject of my longevity being a fortunate occurrence, the cancer had not yet reached my brain. I threw myself into the hands of medical science for treatment. Actually, I never went under the knife. The cancer required chemotherapy. Chemo, I discovered, is short for chemical. And later, a little radiation, in which they sort of microwave the cancer cells away. At the time, the AIDS was treated with a miracle three-drug magic cocktail combination, two antiviral and a protease inhibitor, which in March 1996 had just become available. My initial response to treatment was good. Cancer and AIDS seemed on the way out. The problem now was nausea. 14 of the 15 drugs I was taking to keep me alive had nausea as a side effect. The 15th was an anti-nausea medication that wasn't working so well. The problem with nausea, you see, is not just the wretched feeling, although that certainly is a problem. The problem with nausea is that along with lunch, I also lose my medication. The medication that's keeping me alive, further the primary reason for people stopping cancer treatment, and usually dying as a result, is nausea or excessive weight loss caused by nausea. Frankly, I found it hard to believe that modern medical science all those test tubes and machines that go ping didn't have something better to treat nausea than inhaling the smoke from dried marijuana plants. I mean, herbal folk remedies were fine in the old days, but I needed industrial strength anti-nausea medications to combat the industrial strength anti-cancer and anti-AIDS medication being pumped into my system. Or so I thought. The way chemotherapy works is that it kills the fastest growing cells in the body, whether they're good cells or bad. Certain cancer cells grow faster than most necessary body cells, so the cancer cells tend to die first. The cells that hold the hair in place, however, grow faster than most cancer cells, so these cells die too. That's why people often lose their hair during chemotherapy. The cells holding in the hair dye, and we find ourselves roaming the wig department of Kmart looking for blue light specials. The cells that line the stomach grow faster than most cancer cells, so chemotherapy kills them. Nausea is caused by the instant death of millions of cells in the stomach and, understandably, such nausea can be difficult to control. All the way back in February 1978, I first read about marijuana as medicine in that radical publication, Good Housekeeping, the family doctor column no less. As research proceeds, scientists are finding that major active ingredients in marijuana, tetrahydrocannabinol or THC, may be highly valuable in treating such conditions as glaucoma, asthma, or even terminal cancer. Years later, I read a book that hit me like a thunderbolt. I suddenly realized that marijuana was really medicine. The book Marijuana, the Forbidden Medicine, could hardly come with more impeccable medical credentials. The authors are Lester Grinspoon, M.D., an associate professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, and James Bacalar, J.D., a lecturer in law in the Department of Psychiatry at the Harvard Medical School. The book was published by Yale University Press, no less, in 1993. The publishers thought so well of it that they put out a second edition in 1997. While reading the book, I realized that marijuana is a medicine a legitimate medicine, a remarkable medicine, able to treat a multitude of ills. The doctors chose the phonetic spelling in which the government first introduced the word marijuana to the American people in the 1930s. Many government documents still use it. The chapter common medical uses include a section on chronic pain, cancer chemotherapy, nausea, appetite loss, glaucoma, epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, paraplegia and quadriplegia, AIDS, migraine, rheumatic diseases, osteoarthritis, and ankylosing and spondylitis. 
More include premenstrual syndrome, menstrual cramps, labor pains, depression, and other mood disorders. In the chapter less common, medical uses, the doctor explains, quote, the following medical uses of cannabis are more speculative than those described in the previous chapter, but there is reason to believe they will eventually be accepted. These illnesses include asthma, insomnia, other forms of nausea, antimicrobial effects, topical anesthetic effects, dystonias, Alzheimer's, adult attention deficit disorder, schizophrenia, system sclerosis, Crohn's disease, diabetic gastroparesis, pseudotumor cerebri, tinnitus, violence, a fascinating section by the way, post-traumatic stress disorder, phantom limb pain, and alcoholism and other addictions. So I had a Harvard Medical School doctor in a book published by Yale University Press telling me marijuana was worth a try. The next problem, of course, was where to get marijuana. I hadn't used, much less purchased, marijuana in decades. Was I supposed to go up to people less than half my age and say, Hey, like I'm trying to score some weed, man. So, I was forced, sick as I was. Think of little Eva running barefoot across the frozen river, the DEA yapping at her heels, into the criminal underworld created by marijuana prohibition. As the April 1997 issue of the American Journal of Public Health reported after a 10-year study of 65,000 men and women, relatively few adverse clinical health effects from the chronic use of marijuana have been documented in humans. However, the criminalization of marijuana use may itself be a health hazard. Hello there, good afternoon. I have AIDS and cancer. I need some marijuana that's free of pesticides, molds, and fungus, because those things might give me a lung infection, which is the last thing I need. And I read somewhere that marijuana purchased on the street can be mixed with anything from PCP to heroin, and I don't want any of those. So do you think maybe you can help me out, please? Meanwhile, the war on drugs raged on, catching one medical marijuana patient after another in its capricious, vicious web. So, I finally got some medical marijuana and tried it, and it worked. It was miraculous. Within seconds of the first toke, the nausea was gone, vanished with the smoke into the air. With the second toke, the anxiety and all the other emotional and physical tensions associated with nausea disappeared. By the third toke, visions of pasta trees beckoned. Come! Eat! These sirens ring in the voice of my Italian mother. Just something to tide you over. Many an emergency trip to the bathroom became a meandering raid on the kitchen. With the doctor's words, eat as much as you can, urging me on. I thought I'd already died and gone to Italian heaven. During chemotherapy, the weekly weigh-ins are usually solemn events, based on how much weight the patient has lost due to nausea. The doctor decides whether or not it's safe to continue the life-saving treatment. My weekly weigh-ins, by contrast, were joyful, laugh-filled events slightly reminiscent of the hog-weighing competition at the state fair. The more I weighed, the happier everybody was. It was like Oprah Winfrey's weight loss video played backwards. Medical marijuana also transformed the way I viewed my already wonderful medical treatment. Red Jello again. Mr. McWilliams, your favorite. Medical marijuana made my weekly chemotherapy visits so enjoyable, for me at least. Mr. McWilliams, why are you still here? Why are you wearing that ridiculous babushka? You said I'd lose my hair during chemotherapy. You haven't lost your hair yet. Oh, I'm practicing. Makes me look like Mother Teresa, don't you think? Or Ariana Huffington without makeup. Who is this boy? He's my next patient. I finished with you an hour ago. So do you want me to wait in the waiting room? No, I want you to go home. But I came all this way to see you. Over the river and through the woods. Stop singing, Mr. McWilliams. You've already had your treatment. Now you can go home. Oh, I see. Well, I'll just wait in the waiting room then. My mother worried I'd become a pothead. My brother worried that my sense of humor had fallen to his level. 
I wasn't worried about a thing. In addition to its remarkable anti-nausea effects, medical marijuana had one additional benefit. Now how do I say this without corrupting the youth of this nation? I'd forgotten how enjoyable it is being stoned. I'd forgotten, too, how healing enjoyment can be. Yes, pleasure as therapy. Ease to unravel disease. A deep appreciation of life as an answer to death. I also discovered something that had been cloud-hidden from me for years. My creativity. This may sound strange coming from an old media whore such as myself, who self-published his first book the same month Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band hit the stores, June 1967, and has been at it ever since. Medical marijuana put me back in touch with a creativity that is at the very core of my being. It had been a long time since I felt that. Yes, there is a better world to be had and it is there for creating. Rather than laying in bed and feeling miserable, I was up at the computer and creating my little heart out. I began mixing photographs and texts, and it turned into this book. What would have been a harsh and barren time turned into a flowering of creativity. It wasn't so much what I was creating, but that I was creating. Energy flowing through a system acts to organize that system, the whole world catalog tells us. Creativity flowing through a creative person's system acts to heal that system. With Armageddon going on inside me, I could use all the healing I could get. Creation as an antidote to destruction. Or, to quote the writer's credo, When life gives you lemons, write the lemon cookbook. Another healing benefit of medical marijuana that it opened my senses to the beauty and majesty of the natural world. It seems altogether fitting and proper that a plant would be the bearer of this message. What was once just pretty scenery now felt like home. I saw that I was of nature, not just in it. I stand in awe at this magnificent flute called life. Who would have thought my rainbow's end was not in some celestial by and by, but right in my own backyard? In other words, men are from Earth, women are from Earth, John Gray is from the Moon. I am here. This is now. That is that. Enjoy. Create. I saw that when I'm enjoying the now, truly partaking of it, fully immersed in it, there is no fear of death. Because death and fear are part of a system that believes in there and then, not in the here and now. That's the big joke marijuana smokers and people with life-threatening illnesses often laugh about. Something is happening here, but you don't know what it is, do you, Mr. Jones? As human beings, we gladly take hardship on ourselves, thinking we have somewhere, somehow, saved up all the pleasure we so nobly let pass by. Many people take a healthy helping of the bad. I guess I'll clean out my closet again, thinking there's only so much good that's ever going to come their way. They want to save it all for later. The joke, you see, is that there is no later. Pleasure is like ice cream on a hot day. It doesn't keep. What pleasures we let go by. Close moments with family and friends. The thrill of following a creative idea down the tunnels of our imagination like Alice following a rabbit down a hole. Enjoying a sunset in person or on television. Don't keep. If we don't partake of the pleasure offered to us within a reasonable amount of time, it's gone forever. This speck of life will never come again. By being forced to count my remaining moments, I learn that each moment is precious. If we'd only stop working so hard on enjoying life, we would all have a pretty good time. Selfish? You bet. But I'll have plenty of time to be selfless in the cemetery. 
In fact, after my death, I promise to be completely selfless. Until that golden morn, I find that when I'm taking care of myself first, I can help a lot more people than when a lot of people have to look after a good old self-sacrificing me. But that's not worth thinking about right now. The moment calls. Here comes one. They come all the time, you know. Little moments of choice. The next moment's coming up. Just ahead there. What do you think would be the most life-affirming choice? Pleasure? Or disease? Here comes another. Your choice. Tuning into the flow of the moment and then following it into the next moment is like listening to jazz. Marijuana helps. I find that slowing down and pleasing up releases my emotional, isometric energy so valiantly wasted trying to hold on to the spinning earth, fearing it might fall off. I can relax and be happy right now. Joy. True relaxation. The release of tension. The release of worry. The release of anger. The release of pain. Within that release lies health, or at least the prospect of health. I very much wanted to live now that I knew how much fun it was to live at ease. Wait a minute. This is the wrong format for this book, isn't it? I'm so sorry. I have no idea what went wrong. Obviously a major malfunction. Please ignore all this. Photos, please. But those are just conclusions I came to. Marijuana did wonders for my journey from the perpetual then to the eternal now. Other people come to other conclusions when they use marijuana as a therapeutic time out while confronting death and the meaning of life. Some move to Rome to be closer to the Pope. Others adopt a child. Or plant a tree. Or write a book. Some do just what they were doing before, only appreciating it all a whole lot more. That's part of a question of compassion. Subjects covered in future parts include the risk of using medical marijuana, how medical marijuana works, the benefits of medical marijuana, the history of medical marijuana, how to use medical marijuana. Your thoughts and corrections are always most welcome. Thank you and enjoy from Peter. Okay, uh, go ahead and stop that one and then let's get some, uh, I'm going to do a quick uh, hidey ho. medicine you see right here at the end so this bud right here Peter it's off here this cool is for you man <laughs> This bud's for you. 